Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All right, we're good. I am here with Kim Shore. Kim, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me here today. It is my pleasure. I appreciate you taking the time to tackle this beast of a conversation we're probably going to have. But um, yeah, I, uh, you know, you and I have a background together. I obviously know you from behind the scenes and some work that I did with Gymnastics Canada and some other lectures that you were a part of. So I'm grateful to be able to chat, you know, one on one with a little bit more depth and uh, some topics that are clearly still in the media that are really, really important. But I think just to orient uh, listeners to maybe you and your background, do you mind sharing a quick little uh, elevator pitch on your background and kind of where you are now in life? Sure. Yeah. So I was a gymnast for basically my entire childhood, about 16 years. And then I moved into competitive sport aerobics, as it was called back in the 90s, and uh, really enjoyed that. That was a really nice way to finish off my gymnastics career. Overall, I'd say I had a very good um, sport experience in gymnastics. I absolutely love the sport still to this day. I had uh, one coach that opened my eyes to some, I guess the culture of the sport not being where I thought even as a child, where it would bring out my best. And, you know, that stuck with me for a long, long time. And it was, I had some fairly, um, I, I think some uh, attacks to my confidence and my self-esteem and, and my body uh, physically overused. And so I had that lived experience that I carried with me. And when I left the sport, I left cold. And for 25 years, I didn't look back. I never went into a gym. And when I decided to get back involved in the gym world, I I really had thought, well, this perspective I've gained working in the corporate world as a certified leadership coach is really going to serve me well. And I hope it will add value to the gymnastics community. Mm. And I also had great expectations that the gym community would have evolved quite a bit over those 20 some odd years. And when my daughter was experiencing gymnastics, the first couple years were fantastic. We had the most lovely coach coaching her and she absolutely fell in love with the sport and it was great for the first few years until it wasn't Mm -hmm. and then it was really really awful and you know um so so it wasn't as evolved as I'd hoped and I I put a lot of my personal time into working with the club then I worked at the provincial level and eventually Um, I joined the provincial board and then the Gymnastics Canada board of directors. Mm. And I, I think there's a long way to go in this sport from a culture perspective. I think there's a lot of very talented and educated coaches. Um, I also think they're doing a fantastic job and many of those, and then many of the ones that aren't, treating athletes with the level of humanity that I think is warranted. Uh, There's a lot of hurt people who are now hurting people. Mm. And I have compassion for them because I lived that world myself uh, as an athlete and not, I don't have judgment as much as I just really want to help. And I really want it to end so that our kids are safe so that our coaches love their jobs um, so that we can have healthy environments for everyone to to live and work in. Yeah, it's it's really good to hear. I mean, obviously your background and your perspective. And I think um, there's a couple of things that I always really try to go to blue in the face that, on any podcast, right? Number one being is that the majority of coaches out there are amazing people who really want to do the right thing. And they really love kids and they care about the athletes and they just want to be happy themselves. And I think they're it's either they are led down a path where the culture pushes them to not make some decisions that they're proud of, or the pressure of the overall system becomes high. Like the scaffolding is high to push you into a certain direction of how you coach and the way you lead your gym and the way you do it, particularly if you want to be competitive uh, at a optional elite or college level. And I think people start to mold, unfortunately, into something they're not very proud of. And that's where things kind of get uh, problematic. And I'm in the same boat is that I was so fortunate and so lucky that I I just like by sheer luck got dropped in a gym where 
my coach was an amazing guy and he really cared about everybody and he was he was tough and he was uh intelligent with the way he pushed us but at the same time i never once in my life felt as though there was an attack on like my my character or me as a person or that he was degrading me i always felt as though he had my best interest in mind and if there was even a time where things got a little dicey he was the first person to say you know what i'm sorry i overstepped the lines there a little bit and it's really just because i care about you and your career but what i did there was not appropriate and i apologize but yeah, I, I got really lucky that he was not the best t technical gymnastics coach. He didn't do gymnastics, but he learned a lot. But what I gained out of that was uh, a really honest mentor and someone who helped develop me as a human, right? And that's kind of a big deal of what we'll talk about here. But I think it's really important to revisit this concept because what I see sometimes happening in our culture now is obviously there were huge scandals and there were huge things that came out and there were people who really deserved the full weight of the law and it happened. And then, you know, common people move on people do stuff and it becomes like all right let's move on to this and let's talk about it, it like well no no no. We, we have a lot of other things to still dig up and deal with or another story breaks and i'm current concepts right the parquette situation is happening as we speak and there's so many people that are like yeah thankfully finally right but then also there's tons of people that are like huh that sucks and then they move on and it's like guys that, that's not that's one example of many underlying rooted issues that if we want to lead this for the discussion through truly about empathy and love and caring for the athletes, but also caring for coaches to have the best job possible, the best experience possible, and for them to be happy. We have to collectively keep working on more than the news media coming up and then waving and more than just that layer of what's going on in your gym. But there's a systematic infrastructure here that needs quite a bit of work still. And I think that's where you and I have had some very long email exchanges and <laughs> had some very long discussions because we both kind of see the writing on the wall that while we're making good progress, I think we have yet to pull out the iceberg more than 5% or 10%. I 100% agree. And the worst thing that could happen too is that the media coverage or these types of conversations drive bad behavior even further underground due to right. shame and guilt and embarrassment. Um, that's what we don't want. We want these conversations to instill inspiration into coaches who are struggling to do things the right way and to help them come up and acknowledge, okay, you might have to make amends in this particular area. It's going to take some real moral cur courage to stand up and, and say, I'm sorry, or, you know, to, to he help heal um, on both sides, on both the athlete side and the coach side to help them both heal. We don't want to drive that underground. And, and it's very difficult balance. It's a difficult balance to hold people accountable as well at the same time, uh, lift them into better behavior. Mm. And I think, uh, as I told you, one of the things I've done since leaving the Gymnastics Canada board, um, it started while I was on the board um, and it's carrying on now is the call for an independent inquiry into gymnastics in Canada. You know, we really want to have a look at what's going on in the delivery, the governance and the culture of the sport in our country. And we don't expect results that will be much different than the other countries, the other what nine or 10 countries who have done independent investigations already. Mm -hmm. But what we want to do is focus on moving this culture to a healthier place going forward. You know, it's 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 not. Uh, meant to be a punitive call out. It's meant to be, okay, how can we heal from the past? And how can we ensure that our athletes are safe going forward, that our coaches uh, are healthy minded when they're coming to work, that we provide them with some support and education that will amplify the good things they're doing. And hopefully we can start to move forward in that really healthy way. And, you know, honestly, for some, that's going to mean some coaches need to get out of the business mm -hmm. because they're too entrenched in the mentality that they've always had. But I think to your point, that's such a, a small minority of the coaching group. And the majority of coaches that I've worked with and, and spoken with, they want desperately to do the right thing. Uh, they even, most of them even already know what that right thing is, but the system doesn't allow that they're treated like pariahs. And that's an exact quote from um, a coach on my Facebook account who wrote that they've been made out to feel like a pariah for bringing healthy, positive practices into the gym. 
I, I can't think of anything worse. I mean, that that coach is likely struggling uh, internally very, very much. And 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 that's as bad as any bullying or an, an abuse towards an athlete. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a key to pull out there is you're, you're mentioning that, you know, and I agree with this wholeheartedly is that in order to in or, the same way that you would not discipline, but you would you would help a re athlete realize maybe a choice that they're making is not going to be in their best long term interest. You won't make progress by constantly telling someone what they're doing wrong and saying how bad is this and blah, 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 and all that. You have to not only do that and point out their behaviors, but give them an alternative example to follow of what might be a better course of action. And I feel as though right now, and I, I felt this pressure in the community is, you know, you're, you're sometimes there are people out there painting all of gymnastics by the same brush saying that this one person's a monster. So everyone's, you know, the worst person ever. And I don't think that's true in, in any way, shape or form, but in order for us to help current coaches and also to help the next generation of coaches and also athletes be happier, healthier and everything, we need to highlight and lift up those examples of people who are great coaches. There are as many examples and I can think of 40 off the top of my head, right? Canada, U S Australia, Europe, everywhere. There are great coaches who are treating kids well, they're technically savvy and they're, they're just morally good people and they have a spine to be frank. And yeah. so they are good people to follow. But if we don't set up avenues and we'll talk about this at the end with practical solutions, if we don't set up avenues that are financially and time feasibility wise, easy to access by coaches, how can we expect new coaches or old coaches who do want to change to move into a different uh, mindset or infrastructure of how they work in the gym? Because as we talked about when I was doing those lectures with Gymnastics Canada, coaches have real life frustrations and headaches that they face in the gym working with kids sometimes that are really challenging. And sometimes they are very overworked and very underpaid and they get thrown into the fire without that much education. And then things kind of blow up because they don't really have the tools and resources that they need to operate. And that's not ever an excuse for abusive coaching behavior at all. But at the same time, you can understand their point of view of a parent who is constantly breathing down their neck about my girl needs to make a scholarship and my girl needs to do this and this level. And then you have, say you're in the competitive system well, you have to make this score by this level and move up to this. Then you have a national team, then this, like I can understand that pressure cooker environment because I've been in versions of it. So I think before we dive into more subtopics, we need to just stop and realize that we need to desperately help coaches find a better way. And like you said, stomp out the people, not, you know, that's a harsh word for it, but remove the people who are stigmatizing or who are making fun of or putting social ostracization or bullying those coaches who really want to make a change and not, you know, and that's, that's the role of a gym club too, to make sure that the leader is not, you know, allowing that behavior to be tolerated. But those two things alone, if those don't happen, we're going to never find our way out of this mess. I agree. Yeah. Um, so starting with our little outline we have here, I think a really cool place to maybe start is, is back to that, you know, idea of love and empathy for the sport and stuff. But I think it's cool if we would share, you know, maybe what we do truly enjoy about the sport, because that will guide some of the conversation around what, you know, makes us still so passionate about wanting to try to institute Shane. So please feel free to share yours first and we'll go back and forth because we outlined some good topics. Okay. Um, so I guess when I think back to being an athlete, uh, that's where my love of sport uh, first started. And for me, it was actually a lot about the specific skills because I have vi these really vivid, clear memories. It's like a visceral memory that I can feel still in my body. And it relates to the thrill of a stuck landing or catching that release move. And I guess the the joy that came from finding out that I was capable of those things. And um, yeah, I, I call myself a lifelong learner. I'm like irritatingly curious. I ask a ton of questions. <laughs> Same, <laughs> Same given up <laughs> back here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I love to ask questions. I love to learn. So I think it re the whole idea of um, excelling in a sport fed that desire to learn. And I can still remember this sounds maybe corny, but you know, I love the feeling that I was producing something that was beautiful or unique, like just that ability to, ability to hold yourself in a way that um, expressed confidence, uh, whether I felt it or not, because let's be honest, <laughs> gymnasts are wonderful performers, but there were aspects of movement that I felt made me beautiful and made yeah. what I was sharing with the audience or 
whoever was watching, something that was interesting, perhaps aesthetically pleasing, and um, perhaps you know athletic in a way that showed women were more than just the cute leotard we were wearing and the tidy hair. Uh, no, I was really strong, powerful, and athletic, and yeah. that deserved its res its own respect. Yeah, I, I get that from a lot of people, how it's like it's an art form in a way, right? Like the same way that music is, the same way that theater is, the same way that acting is. Like a lot of people view their sport as an art form and they love, like they, they can't breathe without it. Like I, I wasn't in that category, but I understand that from another point of view is it generally does make you feel completely alive when you do it. So I know a lot of kids who are like that. They love the skills. They love the flipping. They love the, like you said, the accomplishment of a new skill they work on for crazy amounts of time. So I totally understand that. I think for me, and I think what a lot of people might resonate with is for me, it wasn't as much the actual skills, but it was more like the community. And like I said, my coach and I had a great relationship where I felt as though when I could go to the gym, I had a bunch of friends around me who were all training hard. We were pushing each other. You know, I had a lot of um, challenges growing up with like some of my family life and some like mental health stuff. And so I had people to lean on when, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was think about dealing with that. And it was really helpful for me to have people around me who were supportive. So I think, I don't know, I, I've thought a lot about this, that it's probably better that I wasn't like mega, mega talented and made it really, really far and loved the sport of like skills itself. Because mm -hmm. what I developed was the, again, the community, the connections, the relationships, the the mentorship. I really enjoy the the mentorship and like kind of the team bonding aspect of it. But also that, you know, social support is, is if you look at the research on stress management is one of the best ways to buffer really high, um, high stress loads and high training loads, right? When something's going on, you want to tell a friend about it. You want to, you know, have someone just listen to you and gymnastics provided that for me in a way that many other things didn't. So that's why I stayed involved in coaching. That's why I stayed involved in the community aspect. That's why I still love having so many college gymnasts and club gymnasts come to champion and hang out and, and get treated and work out and stuff. It's like, I really enjoy that. I love going to meets and I love like seeing people and relaxing with people and enjoying a common bond like that. So mm -hmm. whether you're in it for the community side, like maybe I was, or whether you're in it for the true skill and the self-fulfillment of working hard on the other part of it. I mean, I think both those things are pretty valuable and, you know, moving into the next piece is like, I think that's what coaches should want to try to aim to do, you know, is to instill in the kid what their love of the sport is or what they want for goals out of the sport. And I think as coaches, as parents, as medical providers, it is our job to help find out what that is for them. And then also build a ladder towards whatever that should be, whether it's they never compete a day in their life and they jump in the foam pit every day and they love that, or they want to do adult gymnastics till they're 90, or they want to go and make it to the Olympics and win gold medals. Like all those for me are on the same level playing field of, of options that coaches can help kids achieve if we, we understand what they want out of the sport, you know? Yes, absolutely. Um, so there based on that is what, what is your approach on? So say a coach is saying, to, to athletes that I'd like to do that, how do you think a coach should go about cultivating what you had, which is that, that big confidence and love for the sport or for me, that community, like how should we pull, not pull that out, but how should we instill that in our cultures of our gym so that coaches can then get that out of the athletes so they have a great experience? Yeah. So I, I'm a big fan of language and I think the more we use language in a space, the more it becomes normalized and, and it can be normalized towards the really negative and unhealthy, toxic creation of an environment or the opposite if we are using positive language. So, you know, I think in the next couple of minutes, we'll be doing a few nods to Brene Brown. Um, I've read a lot of her work and she doesn't use the sport context at all. And yet it fits beautifully. So um, when we talk about cultivating love of sport, you know, I think that looks like even using that language within your gym. Okay, how, how are we going to cultivate love of sport today? How am I as a coach going to cultivate love of sport in this athlete? And how is it going to look different to cultivate that love in this other athlete? Um, I think when coaches are focusing on cultivating that love of sport, it looks like fun. It looks like the intention to incorporate fun and games into the training practice, no matter how old, like a handstand competition is fun for gymnasts. Mm. Um, it does, it doesn't take much and it doesn't have to waste a lot of important training time. Um, so incorporating fun games, growth, positivity, um, walking into the gym with a real openness to see each of your athletes as individual thinking and feeling beings. Mm. Um, again, back to the humanity of, 
the sport, the humanity of the athletes and the coaches. Let's not forget that. You know, we need to shift away from that, from honoring this robotic gymnast that we, I think, have honored for decades. Mm. Um, and we need to get back to thinking and feeling. You know, I never could quite get past um, that one coach I mentioned. She was also the choreographer of our floor routines. And she always wanted me to do these sort of crazy, she had this bird pose she wanted me to do in my floor routine. And I was so um, embarrassed by it that I ended up saying I couldn't do it and I wouldn't do it. And she went about it. But, you know, her pushing me down as a young person and, and squashing so many times my confidence that when she then wanted me to go out and be perform big and and unique and stuff. All I wanted to do was cutesy moves that would keep me safe and within that sort of girlish gymnastics paradigm. So for coaches who want to bring out the best in their kids as athletes and as performers, you also have to um, ensure that you're developing their spirit to feel big, to feel confident, because then they will go out there um, and be able to perform authentically, not as not just performative, mm. but, you know, to express that art and that beauty uh, from a really authentic place. And it's so important too, and this is why, you know, the coaching is hard for this reason. It's an, it's, it's an, its own art form, but that's mm -hmm. why you have to dig in and ask athletes and communicate with them about what their goals are and what they, like, what is fun for them, Yes, right? Like yes. everyone is in this in a different reason. And I think, I worked in club club gymnastics for a long time and you know camps and traveling and coaching and the majority of the people in that setting are really there for competitive nature mm -hmm. and i was um less than happy with some of the the things that we did as, as a coaching uh, team towards that competitive goal so i moved away from the club setting and when i joined this gym that i was a part at i joined the ymca because I, I felt they believed in a lot more different approaches to morals and ethics and how they really approach the sport of gymnastics. And, but within that, they had a competitive club that did do, you know, team and did gymnastics. So we had a, we had team, but we had YMCA stuff. We had, uh, you know, club gymnastics stuff. We had high school stuff. And what the biggest eye opener for me, and which was a, a large part of my transformation and change was to realize like, Oh, not everyone wants to do competitive gymnastics and not everybody wants to do high level competitive gymnastics. So for some athletes, fun for them is literally just trying to learn new skills. They come to open gym. They want to be at practice literally just to learn new skills and see if they can do it for other people. Like I fall in this category. It was coming to do gymnastics because it gave me a social community and an environment that I enjoyed and that I loved right for other people. Some of the people I work with now that are really high level athletes and that are elites. They cannot live without competition. They love competition because it brings out the best version of themselves and it fuels them at a level that I will never understand. I'm the least competitive person, but I can be empathetic to the fact that they're not trying to beat people. They're not trying to win gold medals for their, you know, to, to prove to anybody. It's genuinely what they feel fuels them. And for some athletes, those really, you know, highly competitive athletes, that is fun for them. Winning is fun for them, right? Not beating people, but winning for their own accomplishment is really fun. And then you have a category and many others of, like you said, it's the art, it's the, it's the, the beauty that they associate with it. It's the aesthetics of it. They love the way the skills are and the way it kind of all flows together. I can appreciate that too, as well. Not for me, but, but you know, that's, that's, I understand that. So as a coach, part of what I feel is you have to one, dig into that layer of, okay, why do you want to do this? This is a voluntary thing, right? This is a voluntary choice you make. Why do you want to do this? And constantly revisiting that. And then once you have that scaffolding in place, for me, it's about as a coach trying to give them the opportunity to develop all of the steps they need to reach that goal or make progress or reach their potential, right? That is for me, what, what the love of sport is, is giving athletes the opportunity and a safe environment to do what they want within the realms of gymnastics, right? And I really enjoy that part of coaching because it, it drives me in particular to want to build like a place or a facility that has the dream, that has everything you could possibly need. We have all the resources, the people that you would want, whether again, you want to jump in the phone pit or you want to make national team and go to the Olympics. I think that is the role of the us as, as parents, coaches, and medical providers is to give them the opportunity. And if they change their mind or if they don't want to fulfill that opportunity as they get older, that's okay, but they'll still take a lot out of it on the way up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to your point, you, you need to focus on 
how to set that stage. So what does that mean? Well, you have to be curious. You have to get curious about what each individual athlete is looking for and ensure that they're in an environment that brings that out. Mm. You know, so that leads us into that conversation about practicing self-awareness. You know, mm. as a coach, what do you need to be at your best so that you can go into the gym feeling open and willing and uh, able to connect with your athletes? Yeah, and this was a sorry. Go ahead, and I cut you off. No, that's okay. I was just going to say it. It comes down to some fundamentals, and you know, if if anyone's taking notes, it's what do you need from your athletes? Get in touch with yourself. What do you need from your athletes? Do you need a bit more gratitude? Do you need um, them to show up on time? And then communicate it to them so that there's it's clear. So it's clear, and then. Um, what do you think your athletes need from you as a, as a coach? Well, probably you should ask them. You know, I, I think we don't take the time to ask children um, what is meaningful to them. I'm a parent. I still don't always get that right. So I'm not, I certainly am not sitting here from a preaching perspective and saying coaches need to do all this. It, it, you have to build it into your program. So perhaps it's, you know, when you've got your, list of assignments for your kids that day, what you expect and hope from them. Uh, at the top of that maybe is some questions that that are reminders to you to ask each of your athletes, what do they need from you today mm. you know, to, to bring out their best? Um, give them space to share that. And, and that's going to take time. If you if a coach hasn't developed trust or communication uh, with athletes, you can't go in there and expect athletes to actually answer you honestly. Kids mm. will cover up all kinds of real emotion um, if they've been training in a space that hasn't allowed for authenticity. Mm. And so we have to give them the time to feel that you as a coach are trustworthy and won't use the information they share with you against them at any time. Yeah, I love the idea, and this is actually going to be a really good timing of when this podcast comes out, is I really love the idea of kind of at a bigger picture level of having, whether it's team handbooks or whether it's like the cultural guidelines you create, of having a, a kind of set, uh, you know, structure of what what are the, um, ex not expectations, but what is needed, like you said, from, from a gymnast's point of view or from a parent's point of view or from a coach's point of view for this thing to work, right? Gymnasts need to be, in order to do safe gymnastics, gymnasts have to be on time and properly rested and they have to have the equipment. They have to have the right training things. They have to have the right, you know, attendance and they have to be willing to, uh, willing to listen and all that kind of stuff, right? Just to make gymnastics be safe. Parents have a responsibility to obviously financially support the the product and also be able to uh, fuel the athletes properly and get them there on time. And coaches have the responsibility to be technically knowledgeable and be willing to listen and understand safety and stuff. So we all have this baseline level of uh, responsibility that we all share in order to make those three things come together and build a triangle that is a, a positive environment in gymnastics. So that for me is more like the the kind of the hard and fast black and white things that have to be in place to just get baseline safety going on. But then from there, I, I really enjoyed that communication piece you said, which is what does the party need from each other to be successful? Like what does a parent need from a coach to feel like they're in the loop and they're being communicated about and they understand. Cause if I like, if, if my daughter does softball, I'm screwed, right? I have no idea how to help that athlete. Right. And I'm going to have so many conversations, but like, okay, where does the ball go? And what's that thing? Is that a bat? Where do they hit that thing? Like I have no idea about that sport. So I'm going to need a lot from that coach someday to educate me about how to be a softball dad. Right. And I think, will right you now, though? but will you, because honestly, maybe. you're, uh, maybe not. My belief is our role as parent isn't to understand the technical aspect of the sport. That's that true. is actually the coach's job. So maybe actually what's harder not. for you might be to stop coaching and just be the dad. That's true. That's true. Okay. Maybe I should rephrase that is I will need to be educated from the, the softball culture or, around other than just being a nice human. What else do I need to do to make sure that she is successful in softball at some point in life? So yeah, I think we need that, right? The, the, the parent communication needs to happen. I think that like, that's like you said, the parent and gymnast communication is obviously really important because they're your child and they're the person that you spend a lot of time with. But then also a coach needs to ask, what do you need from me? Like if you're having a tough mm -hmm. day, I understand that. Like, okay, this is not working well. What do you need from me today to help this be somewhat successful of practice and vice versa? There has to be communication about what is needed the other way, which is, you know, how to make sure the coach is, is listening and on top of things. So 
I, I believe in that. I really believe in that model wholeheartedly. And then there's that next layer, which is the personal layer, which is digging into yourself and figuring out like, what do I need to do personal development wise to bring my best version of myself to the gym every day. And mm -hmm. same thing from a parent and same thing from a gymnast. You know, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I, every time I use this phrase, I think of you and it dates back at least three or four years now, but you, you used the phrase in, in your early podcast, hold the mirror up. Yeah. And, um, I thought that was, that's so important and it really speaks to that ability to self-reflect and without self-reflection as a human being. So whether we're talking about the parent and the role they're playing in the athletic journey of their kids or the coach, the ability to self-reflect is essentially what we're talking about here, mm. holding that mirror up, looking at it and going, okay, how does my personality style influence my coaching style? Mm -hmm. you know, what um, can I do to consistently bring out the athletes, the, the best in my athletes? Um, what do I need to do to adjust my coaching approach for different learning styles of different kids? Uh, how might my style uh, cause others to shut down their openness to learning? You know, some kids don't want to talk about feelings and emotions and have all this huggy, huggy stuff. And mm -hmm. a lot of kids are completely the opposite. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what's the cost of not recognizing individual differences? Mm -hmm. There is a cost to that. It's it, and the cost is the happiness of the athlete and frankly, the ability for them to reach their potential. And then it must result in a high level of frustration for the coach because they see the potential in that athlete um, and they don't know how to bring it out. Yeah. And we'll, we'll spend a lot of time, I think, digging into that concept of self-reflection. And I think, you know, it's important to realize I always, again, this is something I try to hold up, you know, on, uh, honestly in the podcast is I think the reason people gravitated towards my story is because it dealt a lot also with personal happiness and it dealt a lot with me wanting to not feel like garbage because I was overworked and I was stressed out and I didn't really, you know, have the best mental health state. So I, I wholeheartedly know and agree that it's, it is about the athletes first because without the gymnast, there is no sport, but also what I try to share with people is that, that uncomfortable self-reflection that you should do and that I did while it was challenging in the short term and it still continues to be challenging when these things come up the net positive of how much happier I am and how much more productive I am and how much more excited I am to be involved in gymnastics was directly relationship upward to that doing that work and so when we talk to gymist about you know you have to put in the work and you have to be disciplined and you have to delay gratification and you have to like keep working at it even when it's not going your way well, that matters for you in your own life. Like that matters for you in your own personal development of mm -hmm. wanting to use your actions to set an example of what you're trying to do and teach the athletes, which is you can't say you value health and yet you, you value hard work and that you want them to work really hard while you're sitting on a block eating Cheetos, demanding someone do more rope climbs. Like good luck with that culture trying to build up that athlete, right? And for <laughs> you personally, I don't, I, I would be willing to bet that you don't feel awesome. If you sleep five hours a night, don't work out, don't drink water and eat Cheetos all the time. Right? Like I like fun foods. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big nachos guy, but if I had nachos five days a week, I'd probably feel like crap. So that's really important that people are digging into themselves and figuring out what's going on and kind of bringing this back full circle with you is, is so say we have this idea of love of sport and wanting to provide opportunities for, for a good culture and environment. What are the characteristics of a coach that for you, that would look like if a coach did these things on a daily basis, it would, it would provide more opportunity for there to be a very good love of sport and gymnastics. Yeah. I guess from my point of view, I, another nod to Brene Brown is aspiring to be wholehearted, um, wholehearted coaches, wholehearted athletes. Uh, what does that look like? Well, you know, for, for an athlete, it looks like kids who go into the gym focused and confident they have the courage not to hold back, whether that's in expressing themselves to their coaches, to their parents, um, or to not hold back uh, physically on skills, to have some mental toughness, to persevere, because there will be difficult times. Sport should be challenging. It should demand um, of us. That's what makes an athlete special. Mm. But if kids can be driven by joy, rather than fear or anxiety, any of those things, I think there's the opportunity to take 
it really truly to the next level in the way that all of us hope for our kids, hope for our athletes and hope for ourselves if we are the athletes. Mm. So yeah, um, for coaches and athletes, both, um, again, back to being wholehearted, to be the best, best version of yourself, you need to be seen and heard. Uh, you need to feel a certain level of respect coming your way. You have to feel safe. And so that speaks to the club owners and the and the states or the provinces who are educating these coaches. We need to create safe environments where coaches don't have to be perfect because they're likely former gymnasts, especially if you're of my era and you grew up in an environment where perfection was actually all you were striving for, the perfect 10. I mean, it was set up right from the scoring system to perpetuate this notion of perfection. So we need safe environments for coaches and athletes. Coaches need to feel like they belong. And I'm sure we'll dive into this more, but I have seen some real, I'll call it um, high school mean girl Coaching, <laughs> coaching groups and you know the coaches coming to the gym with their hair perfectly uh done and makeup and the whole bit and and the ones that don't aren't considered the cool ones and so you know that sense of belonging is really important but i feel like the sense of belonging has been driven for so long by coaches who are powerful and also of that old school mentality. So we need to help coaches change that so that they are striving to belong to a very healthy social group. Because let's face it, when you're a coach and you're in the gym 40 hours a week, plus all the at home stuff you need to do to keep up with emails from parents and medical providers and all that, like it's your whole life. So your, your social group is often limited to the people that you work with. Mm. Uh, and and to be wholehearted, you need to feel connected to your community. Um, you need to feel like you're making a meaningful contribution. And so for coaches to sort all that out um, is really important for their own well-being and their own happiness. And when you walk into the gym and you are with a group of eager 10 year olds, 12 year olds, 18 year olds, it doesn't matter if you're giving them the best version of yourself because you have taken care of all of those um, be seen, heard, respected, safe, have a sense of belonging, feel connected, and, and feel like you're contributing. When you bring that to the table, oof, you're unstoppable on every platform in every way. Yeah. And I, for the for the visual listeners, we had that graphic up, which I think is a really good summary of, of those things they can look to. And I think this reminds me of uh, during some of those talks in Gymnastics Canada, I just happened to have listened to um, an interview with uh, John Mackey, who's the CEO of Whole Foods, I believe, I think that's his name. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how like, like, what do employees in this case, coaches, what do people need to be really happy with their experience at work and be the best versions of themselves. He said they need to be, you know, stable in terms of financially and also in terms of like their work, right? They need to be paid properly. They need to make sure they have the right education. They need to have to make sure that, but more importantly, they want a sense of belonging and they mm -hmm. want a sense of meaning, right? If, mm -hmm. if you cover the basics of, we'll make sure that you're getting adequately reimbursed for your time and your effort. After that, once that box is checked, what do a lot of people want out of their job? They want to find some place that they they belong, they have a social community and that they're doing meaningful work, right? And that underpins how I've kind of created a lot of my everything that I do and how I choose projects is I it, my order of my priority filter is my health, meaningful relationships and meaningful work in that order, right? So if, if something doesn't fit one of those three things well, and I don't feel it's contributing to those three things, I don't do them you know, because I believe that. And that's how we try to build our staff up. That's how, to, how we try to build everybody up is like, well, if I think, I think health is connected to you're paid for your time so you can buy groceries and do the things you want to do whenever. But then after that, it's meaningful relationships are really that foundation of belonging and meaningful work. Well, that is the same thing as having something that's meaningfully to produce. So for, for a lot of people, I think, unfortunately, I see this quite a bit and I saw this in myself, which is why I was getting a little bit upset with myself as a younger coach is it, it started to become less about those three things and more about like bar fame or pub fame. Like they wanted, uh, I saw a lot of coaches who, who just wanted everyone at the bar after the meet to say how awesome they were and how great their kids were. And, oh my God, I can't believe she's doing the skill and she's so awesome. How'd you develop that bar? Blah, blah. And it was like, that's cool. I understand you can, you can have praise for when you do hard work, but if you live for the addiction and the validation of other people, 
you are building yourself into a corner that is going to be very, very hard to get out of because you're constantly trying to jump on the, on the treadmill on the hamster wheel of praise me, tell me I'm good enough, tell me I'm a good coach, tell me I look pretty, tell me that I'm, I'm doing well, tell me I make enough money. Like totally. it's very, very, it's a dangerous place to be into. And I found myself, that's how I slid into a tough spot because I wanted that social media fame and I wanted that attention. But I still see a lot of people who are, um, that is the root cause of why they're really, really cruel to the kids when things don't go well in the gym. Isn't that so interesting? Because I hear coaches talk all the time about we need to develop intrinsic motivation in these kids. Um, so let's not compliment them and, and do give them too much external validation because we want them to be intrinsically motivated. That's a great principle. Um, but then look at how it's playing out in our own lives as adults. Um, you know, society has completely shifted towards external validation as a way to live with, you know, likes on Instagram and Facebook and so on. It's a completely externally validated existence for so many. And so we are modeling that to kids unless we're very, very conscious of not doing that. Mm. And and to expect it um, out of kids, you, you can't actually, um, you can influence that, but it's a developmental process for children mm -hmm. to go from being very reliant on directions and validation from parents and caregivers to coaches to then relying on themselves. And to try to expedite that, which I think I experienced, my daughter experienced it, so I know it still goes on, um, to try to expedite that 10-year-old into being completely self-reliant and self-driven by age 10 is actually not developmentally appropriate. And it's usually being done through um, fierceness and harshness to try to expedite it as opposed to just allowing it to play out and, and contributing to it and nurturing it and allowing it to, to unfold over the next eight years, you know? Mm. And it's funny now that it's clicking in my head of that comment about like the mean girl situation too. Like, so think about what is the, what is in seventh grade or in grade school, what is the driving, you know, motivation behind a bully or behind someone who is really gossiping and someone who's superficial it's insecurity, right? It's, it's fear and insecurity. And it's wanting to, you know, again, have, have a peer group and belong and try to be popular and cool. And I just find it so funny sometimes how we see the same behavior in some areas of the sport, not all, but we see the exact same thing in 40 year olds as we do in 14 year olds, which is this, this social kind of jockeying for, for fame and for attention and for validation and stuff. And I think in the same way that we hope that when those athletes are demonstrating that behavior, when they're 14, that's not you know, socially okay, the golden rule kind of thing that we correct that behavior in them, but then we'll be the first person to maybe fall victim to it when we're out, you know, at a dinner or something like that after a meet. And I think that's where that catalyst of self-reflection comes for some people. Unfortunately, it, it, it's not until it becomes what I call an emotional catalyst, which is, it feels so crappy that something is not going well, or you hurt someone's feelings, or you're unhappy with your life situation that you're like, you know what, it's time for a change, you know? And I think that's where it comes back to, Yes, being disciplined about realizing that social media is a tool that you can use for good, or it can become a, a vice. It can become a, an attention factory. It can become a constant validation. And a very important principle that I've learned through my roller coaster, and that I've also tried to teach all the athletes I work with, is that you should never let anyone or any person or anything be the sole driver of your self esteem and your motivation and your happiness, right? If you are constantly depending on other people to make you motivated or other things to make you happy or other things for your self esteem, you're going to, you're going to find yourself in a very vulnerable spot because it's never enough. And most gymnasts have unrelenting standards, so it will never, ever be enough. They'll always need more and more and more. And then as soon as they get it, it'll go away and then they'll, they'll want something else. So it's for coaches to make themselves happier and for athletes to hopefully get this as a, as an indirect is trying to dig in and figure out, well, how, how can I be kinder to myself and motivate myself? And how can I do intrinsic motivation? Like you said, well, how can I make progress steps towards the things that I want because it's meaningful to me and I want to put in the work to get there. That's intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is not degrading someone until they pressure themselves into doing what you want. It's, it's cultivating in them. What are your goals? What do you want out of this? And how do I help you as a joint partnership to get to that goal? You know, not the other way around. Absolutely. And I loved how you said it's like progressive steps. The, this whole conversation is actually fairly aspirational. And there is no um, 
you know, all of a sudden you show up and you're fully um, self-aware and so forth. It's aspirational. So any coaches uh, or parents that are listening, um, it's again, not to drive your behavior underground. Don't walk away from this conversation feeling shameful about how you have been up until this moment. Um, use it as an opportunity to set a, a new expectation of yourself, a new hope for yourself with self-compassion, bring a bit of a different energy into the gym tonight when you go to practice. Mm. Bit of bring a bit of a different energy to your parenting when your children get home from school. Um, you know, it's aspirational. None of us are going to step into um, getting rid of all of the behaviors that we've been entrenched with for some of us decades, mm. but it's continually um, striving towards how can I inject a little bit more positivity? How can I inject a bit more self-reflection? If I do those things, if I do some of the hard work, let's see where that, how that pay, plays out and what the payoff is for it. And mm. wow, is it ever worth it? And then you're a walking testimony of, of okay. that hard work and how it's paid off for you and, and for your athletes and your friends and the people around you. Well, I'm flattered by that. Yes. And I, I wish I could say, you know, that it wasn't a little bit of a selfish intent when it did happen. Cause for me, it was like 2014 and 2016 was the, you know, what I call the dip into chaos and the climb into clarity. You know, it's like <laughs> that happened for me in that section. And because I felt like crap, I did not want to go to work. I was burnt out and I was tired and I was exhausted and I was depressed. And I had a lot of social anxiety because I was constantly worried about what people thought about me because I needed their approval. And I was so addicted to everybody telling me that I was smart enough or attractive enough or a good coach or this or that, that within myself, it was, it was like an, in, it was like an internal corrosion of my own negative self-talk and my own negative thoughts. And so because of going through so many years of, of a combination of needing that addiction and validation and lifestyle choices that were directly making me feel worse, right? Like drinking a little bit too much and eating like not the best and skipping those workouts and sleeping five hours. So I could try to write a blog post, like things that in the long scheme of things with shift probably wouldn't have mattered if I stayed up till two in the morning doing it. But all those things made me more irritable and made me more cranky in the gym. And that's when the spiral started to happen. So this does lead to a very, I want to make sure we get to this question. And it's actually perfect that we put it in here is with either my example or the coaching examples, what are some of these cultural aspects or, or what are the behaviors that we're seeing drive negative or positive coaching environments? And like, what do you think are the things that are like, if you see that in the gym, you're like, oh, that's a good thing. It's good that they're doing that. Or if you see that in the gym, you're like, that is not a good thing. That is, that is a dangerous thing we want to be careful of. Okay, you start because you okay. are more an expert in, in what to see in the gym. And I'd love to hear your perspective. Sure, absolutely. So for me, and I'll talk about what I think you see as red flags and then what you can do about it. So one is that if you see resentment, resentment and gossip for me is is the, is the hydraulic acid of, of a culture, right? It, it erodes the bedrock of your foundation. So if you see the side comment, the whispering, the, 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 the little bickering, right? That kind of stuff for me is like red flag, hail the alarms. We need to have a conversation about something clearly because right now what we're doing is we're gossiping behind people's backs and that's not going to be good. So anytime there's, there's gossip or whispers or comments or, you know, side handed off shots or stuff like that, that's always a red flag for me in terms of verbal communication, mm -hmm. nonverbal communication for me is, is stonewalling people is, is ignoring people is walking past somebody without exchanging eye contact, or this happens from coach to coach. And this often sometimes, um, also happens with, with, coaches towards certain athletes that are injured or towards certain athletes that they deem are not working hard enough. Or, you know, there's a time and a place when athletes are being disrespectful and you have to call out that behavior. But for a lot of these situations, because someone's hurt or because someone's not as talented or because someone maybe is not, doesn't have that high level goal of being competitive anymore, they get stonewalled by a coach and they get kind of like psychological warfare. Whereas I'm not saying anything wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just ignoring you. And that's, that's psychological neglect. That's emotional neglect. And that is, just as damaging as the gossip behind the scenes. So those two things for me are major, major red flags. And I'm not sure if you have any other thoughts on that, but. Yeah, I would agree with those are absolute red flags. And, and those, those could be called out. You can call yourself out on those. What, yeah. what are, you know, what are we as adults doing to contribute to that environment? Um, in my experience in, in the, 
few times I was a substitute coach at a gym, I really had my ear to the ground as to how the adults in the space were behaving. Um, mm. You know, I obviously was paying attention to the kids as well, but I also was really aware of what was happening to me as an adult in that space and how I felt. And it wasn't great. And I think also coaches forget that even seven-year-olds have really big ears. They hear everything. I mean, the stuff that would come home to me and the stuff I heard firsthand while I was on the floor at the gym, it was appalling. Like the mockery of other parents that, you know, and the whole concept of the crazy dad or the crazy gym mom um, being said within earshot and then comments about uh, people's bodies. I heard comments about other coaches' hairdos, like commenting that so-and-so had a mullet and, and all the kids could hear it. And I'm like, how, how is this happening? This is not a healthy environment for the kids or the coaches. Back to the seventh grade lunch table. Here we are. Right? A hundred percent. And, and, you know, I found myself checking my mirror or my makeup out in the mirror to make sure it was perfect before I went to the gym. That's ridiculous. I was mm -hmm. like a 40 something year old woman. <laughs> so that is not, I mean, I extricated myself from that environment right away. That is, that would not have been good for, for my mental health going forward. I don't know how coaches can live in that environment. So. Yeah. And again, another thing that I think, I don't know whether I chose it or whether I got dropped into it lucky, but like, I think there's two pieces to it. One is the leadership aspect and two is the self-development aspect. But from the leadership point of view, this is where you need someone who runs the gym or who is the head team coach or whatever else it is to have a freaking spine and to mm -hmm. be able to stand up and call out some of these things. Because my boss, Eva, is amazing. Man, I'm, I'm so lucky to have her. She's one of my best friends, but she's the perfect balance of empathetic and will listen to people and proactively goes out of her way if she can feel the vibe is off, right? So if somebody comes in a couple of days in a row and they're really stressed out and they're they're running all their classes and they don't have it like they're, they're just, they look really emotionally distraught, she will go out of her way to say, hey, are you okay? Everything all right? And sometimes it's like, you know what? Work's crazy and I have so much stuff to do and I'm just really stressed out right now, but I'll be okay. And that's like, we find our way through it. And other times, it's like, you know what? No, this this coach that I'm working with is, is always late and they, they, they're they not doing what they want or not doing what they need to do. And I they, they don't make their lesson plans. And I'm stuck with all the burden because I care about the kids. And then it opens up a good discussion about like, oh, OK, well, let's 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 figure this out rather than just, you know, letting that coach blow by you when you're in the office, all frustrated and stressed out like, oh, it sucks. You know, just let that ride. And then that festers and that becomes toxic to later down the road when it blows up in a staff meeting. And, you know, you have, you know, Sarah and Susie and Sarah's like, Susie, you're never here. And like, oh, I do all your stations, right? Like that's how these things erupt. And so for us at our gym, we're lucky to have Eva, but she taught that skill to everybody else of having your eyes open at all times and, and being understanding and empathetic and, and sensitive to people's moods and people's words and trying to figure out like, is there a problem we need to address? That's when we adopted our pro our policy of just radical candor and radical professional discussion. Because if we don't have the the uh, footing to talk about moderately uncomfortable situations or challenges, how in the world are we going to talk about something that's really, really hard, right? When we talk about some bigger issues. So for me, as from the leadership point of view, I think if you are a gym coach or if you are a, a leader, you're a gym owner, if you're someone in a position of leadership, that is your responsibility. That is what leadership means. It's taking on more responsibility to be the person to do that. And so I think on the other side of this, the coin, which is what I learned myself through Eva and other people is that is where that it starts with you concept comes from, right? That I really believe that if you want to have a better gym, it is a responsibility of each individual person to look into what their own fears are and their own insecurities and their own demons, so to speak. Right. And, and to be willing to dance with those things and look them in the eye and figure out what do I need to do to make myself happier and be responsible for my own emotions and my own feelings. For me, it was working less and going to therapy. I was working 85 hours per week, trying to run a business and doing everything like that. I was extremely burnt out and extremely stressed out. And then on top of that, I just, just stuffing all of my own crap, into the closet and be like, no, nah, I'll deal with that later. So once I was able to find a therapist who I could dig through some of that stuff in my past, and then also I could work less and work more productively and hire a team and get what do you think Becky and Taylor and Sarah came from? It's because I was imploding behind the scenes trying to figure this out. And I was extremely burnt out. And I was going through major depression that I was like, finally, I have to do something, right? So I stopped working as much. I put more time into myself. 
And I, I started to hire a team and it got over the course of five years, I slowly became more and more positive as a person. Shocking, the girls did better <laughs> competitively and they were happier in the gym because I wasn't such of a monster. So it starts with you. Then you have to learn those communication skills of how do you talk to people? How do you interact with people? How are you empathetic? How do you have professional disagreement? Like that learning the art of communicating is very important. And then that expands to the group, which is how do you manage a group of 10 people on a squad, whether it's preschool, whether it's a coaching staff, whether it's an optional staff, how do you control group dynamics and teach those communication skills and teach how to help each other? Because everyone's so different. If you build layers like that, that is how you, you change some of these, these more toxic environments. Yes, absolutely. And I think um, there are definitely training um, mechanisms for helping expedite that as well. You know, I do a workshop called Colors and it's it's like a Myers-Briggs or an Insights. You know, it's that the whole understanding yourself first and then applying that to your interactions with the general world. And and I've actually done that coaching or sorry, that Colors workshop with hundreds of coaches uh, in in my province. And and it was very well received because it allowed them to see what was important to them, them and their as an individual and then to hear from other people what was important to them. And instead of thinking that that person's just a jerk for, you know, the way they tackle a problem um, and it being so different than the way, say, I might tackle a problem, it, it really builds compassion. And and again, back to curiosity. Instead of saying to someone, you know, why are you doing it like that? Why are you being like that? You you learn with um, this improved communication strategies. You learn to ask questions like, tell me more about your perspective here and, and tell me more about what's driving the way that you're tackling this problem. And then you you build understanding, which builds empathy, which builds connection and all the things we just talked about that are so necessary in a team environment. Um, but if we just keep leaving it to fester the, and there isn't an Eva in your midst that mm. can step in and apply real leadership to a situation, that's a big problem. And again, that speaks to the governance of the sport. So now you start looking at the board of directors. Are they well-intentioned uh, individuals or are they sitting there because uh, it's a requirement of the club that you have to be a competitive parent to sit on the board of directors for a club which I think is preposterous it mm -hmm. actually should be all the rec parents <laughs> who have some time on their hands who yeah. join the board of directors because they are likely to be the least conflicted um, they're not trying to get their kids um, all the opportunities um, like a scholarship or on to make a team and to get more attention from the coach, their kids are there purely for the fun of it. And mm. perhaps they're involved in another sport more seriously or, or not. But mm. most clubs in Canada, anyway, to be on the board of directors, you have to be a competitive parent of a competitive mm. gymnast. And it, that invites all kinds of, of, struggle there's just no way for that parent to be objective in that situation to put pressure on the head coach you know i i know of executives in that are essentially head coaches of clubs who walk into their offices put their hands on their hips and just look around with that bullying and intimidating look and then walk out and those are the people that are supposed to then go onto the floor and pick up a vibe that maybe things aren't going well and gently and compassionately nurture their coaches to better behavior. Like that makes no sense. So, and I, I agree. And again, I just keep coming back to this like seventh grade lunch table. What, what is the person doing who comes into the gym and puts their hands on their hips and just scans the room and wants to do it right it's perceived status. They want to feel, they want to feel elevated. They have ivory tower complex. What do you think is happening with so many of these like, you know, blockbuster cases of coaches that are cripplingly abusive, right? It's definitely not for compassion and empathy. It's control. It, it's perceived status. They feel as though they need people's approval and to be over people in order to be whatever, happy, successful, who in the world knows, a powerful, I don't know. Yeah. But it, it comes like, that's where it needs to be. Cause there's, 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 um, there's parallel scaling layers to this, whether we're talking about the coach 
that runs this department being able to check this in the people who they work with or the head coach checking all the coaches or the gym owner checking all the people who work there or the state level checking the gyms that are in that state or Providence or NGB. There's always this like um, checks and balances system where you have to have people who are one, you have to have a central moral and ethical contract of what the guy, like how do you operate? And what, what are the behaviors that are acceptable, which we're getting towards, which is good. But if, if no one ever enforces that, how in the world do you expect to see progress, right? Like, because there are times when a leader either has to force someone to leave or you have to leave. That's the only option. That's all you come down to because every time you try to have these conversations or every time you try to make change, it never goes anywhere. And so I think that as a, as an, as a sport, as a peer group in the sport, we have to be willing to put positive social pressure on the people who are doing well. And we need to put negative social pressure on the people who are, breaking the rules and are making us all look bad because we're trying to do the right thing. And some asshole over here is the one who constantly yells at the kids or is constantly, you know, showing up late and doesn't want to do his job and thinks he's better than everybody else like that. Or, or, you know, thinks that for some reason, because they coach a higher level that that makes them somehow better inherently than somebody else. And it, it requires a lot of courage, like you said, morally to do that. But that is the only way that you can you can build an environment like that. And it comes back to a concept in um, Daniel Kanye's book called My, uh, like called The Culture Code, which talks about micro interactions. That is really the foundational hallmark of a lot of these conversations, which is when you walk past somebody and you choose to look them in the eyes and say, hey, how are you? Or when you're building a circuit and you ask the other coach you're working with, well, what do you think we should do for drills? Right. Or you go out and you do something as a non-staff event or whatever, and you actually genuinely care about listening how that person is or what they do outside of the gym. Or, hey, I heard that your your uh, partner is going through an illness. I hope they're OK. Mm -hmm. Where do you think culture comes from? It comes from those small two second passing interactions that that that's what builds the foundational bedrock of, of a really successful environment. And all those things add up. It's like some people, some people leave their job because of death by a thousand cuts. It's not some huge blowout scandal. It's just totally. the side comment, the side comment, the look, the neglect, the gossip that, and then they implode and that's why they leave. Absolutely. And unfortunately, guess what, everybody, we know better than we did even 10 years ago. Yeah. You can't unknow that, you know, the public is starting to catch on to where we're at. Right. Um, and as soon as that gets, you know, to that tipping point where the the general public is acknowledging or even um, misconceiving miscon what is going on, but it looks negative to the public. That's the last thing we want because there are thousands and thousands of people whose livelihoods depend on this sport, the, whose livelihoods depend on those athletes being happy. And I'm not talking about placating them. I'm talking about treating them kindly, mm. treating them with humanity developing them in a in an appropriate way that that leaves them um better better people better children better young adults for having participated in the sport because as soon as we lose that or or it becomes more widely known that we're not really stepping up and doing the job we should be as leaders in gymnastics our clubs are lost mm. um you know so we are we're morally obligated to do better um, we have to stay open to the changing expectations and to do the work that each of us as individuals needs to do to elevate our, our behavior, elevate our practices, elevate um, what we're contributing to the sport. Mm. Um, you know, we expect athletes to make changes with every correction that a coach gives them, right? Like if that kid doesn't go back to the end of the vault runway and execute the next vault, we, incorporating the correction you gave them as a coach there's not a lot of tolerance for that mm. but yet we seem to tolerate from each other as adults um a very slow progress towards change mm. i go back to when i i did re-enter the sport and get involved because my my kids were doing it and i said to my husband don't worry i i'm Sure, everything has changed. I'm sure it's gotten better in the 25 years I've been away. But if it's not, and if I start to see things that I'm not comfortable with, I'll get involved and I'll fix it. I honestly thought that the the problems that I was seeing were isolated to the gym my daughter was at. And I thought, give that two years, I'll have this thing solved. I'll, <laughs> I'll do some workshops for these coaches. I'll support them. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll nurture them in a positive way and I'll work on the parents to make sure that they're nurturing them. 
that did not work. That might surprise you. I did not fix the world in two years. And here we are, what, six, seven years later, and I'm, I'm still at this because I love the sport. The sport is wonderful. And it touches the lives of millions of kids. Between the U.S. and Canada, I think the statistic that I last saw was, I mean, we're above 5.5 million gymnastics participants. Wow, that's incredible. Right? That's a huge amount of kids that are touching a vault, touching a floor mat, um, experiencing the joy of a cartwheel. Mm. Um, so so if, there's a lot to be lost there if, yeah. we, if we don't do this. And, and, and I think we're past the point of saying, I didn't know. I'm sorry, but I didn't know. Well, it doesn't work like that anymore because we all know it's shows like yours, right? These podcasts come out weekly. If you're not listening to these podcasts, then shame on you, you know, or the 50 other podcasts that are out there to help educate yourself, whether it's gymnastics specific or any sport or frankly, any self-development, like we're way past. I didn't know. Hmm. And we, we can't tolerate abusive behavior toward anyone by anyone. So no abusive coaching, uh, coaching, no abusive parent to coach interaction, no abusive coach to athlete interaction. We're way past tolerating that. And, and we have as youth serving organizations, these clubs have special obligations to children in the care of our clubs. And there's no getting around that. There's a UN convention for the rights of the child that states that mm. it's internationally known. So us saying we didn't know, we're way past that. Yeah. And I, I want to pull out one really important thing that you mentioned, which is the the volume of kids, like you said, are doing it. But the, the positive benefits that they get from the sport when this is done well is incredible. And I think incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why pe people like yourself and I, and so many others still believe and still do so much work because, you know, I mean, all sports don't get me wrong. And we're going to get into some conversations around like, you know, some tough love around maybe maladaptive coaching practices. But before that, I want to highlight and emphasize that m gymnastics more than any other sport, I think, and I still haven't quite put my thumb on this, but I think it's because of the relationship with fear of skills. Skills are hard. Skills are scary the pressure of competing and you're the only one out there. It's a very unique sport where it, it fosters incredible people. And I, obviously I understand gymnastics skills are the goal, but it's a vessel to teach people some bananas things that they're going to use them later in life. Right. I think about friends of mine, um, my best friend, Josh Fox, who was one of the better gymnasts that I ever worked with. He was incredible, but at the same time, man, he developed over the course of 10 years, just absolutely like ice in his veins pressure and, and just the ability to handle pressure because he's really talented so he's always last in our lineup and he always would just like sometimes he would do great sometimes he would stick and it would be amazing but he developed like this incredible tolerance to discomfort and pressure that he works in an icu now as a critical care physician's assistant and he has the experience of gymnastics of learning how to handle fear and learning how to handle gymnastics and having social support he works he, what he's doing is credible it's as absolutely incredible so that's an example of what I see is the potential of what happens when we we are willing to do the hard work that we'll talk about soon. And we are willing to look in the mirror. We are willing to, you know, make lifestyle changes and life, make cognitive changes because not only will we be happier as people, adults working in the sport who are finding something very, very meaningful to do with our time, but also I firmly believe that by by building environments that have great kids and great cultures, that you're fostering people who are going to go on to contribute to curing cancer or who will help solve world hunger or who will do just raise an amazing gym of their own someday. And they will carry on the legacy of what gymnastics can do for people. And I think I think that's lost on people. Sometimes they realize the magnitude and the positive impact that a sport like gymnastics can have, which is why so many people are, you know, obsessed with it because it does such incredible things when done well yeah absolutely okay so from there let's kind of chat about maybe the other side of the coin which is less ex less uh pretty to talk about which is something that you and i know is very existent and that it doesn't always come out you know terribly but this whole like win at all costs mentality right which i think a lot of the bigger problems have have been in competitive gymnastics right like the recreational side you don't hear many 
you know, abusive scandals coming out of preschool, thank God. But um, I think a lot of times as you get competitive and as you get higher up and wanting to compete and, and do well, that's where we sometimes get into hot water. Again, not all coaches, but a good, a, a big enough percentage where we have to talk about it. And for me, when you dig into like, okay, where does this come from? Like, why, why does someone develop this, like, almost like a, like brainwashed or intoxicated, like need to win and the need to push and the need to get better levels. Where does this come from? For me, again, I was guilty of this is that I, I never got too extreme, but I felt myself waxing and waning with the girls were doing well, competing well, and I was happier. The girls would do not so great at a meet. I would feel like I was not, you know, happier. I was, I was a bad coach, quote unquote. So for me, if you get into the, the pockets of the gymnastics world that are unfortunately the darkest, this concept of whether you're being virtue led or vice led starts to be, you know, a really, really important. And so I want to first say that there is a way that this goes where there's a healthy intensity and a drive passion, right? Excitement, because you're working towards a common goal. Gymnastics is hard. So making a level or making a team or winning this or doing that, if you have a healthy foundation, you can establish a shared, uh, a shared progress towards a common goal between a coach, a parent, a medical provider, and an athlete. And it can be very, very healthy. And that's very, very, in my mind, virtue led. It's it, but could, because it never puts health ahead of those things, no matter how excited you get and how passionate you get and how ready you are. If an injury comes up or if someone is really tanking emotionally or mentally, the coach, the parent, everyone says, you know what? We're going to take a break here. We're going to, we're going to step back. We're not going to push through this, right? That for me is that's sport. That's just sport in general that you can have a healthy outlet for that. But for me, what happens is when you tip to the other side of, of not only being vice led, but the, the vice is leading you. It's a rule. It's a ruling your life. For me, there's three things that I see consistently when I talk to people and I hear about their problems. Number one is that status or that fame chasing, right? It becomes okay. It becomes a vice when you become addicted to the praise of everybody else, like you said, and that score literally drives your self-esteem, right? Or the performance drives your self-esteem versus it's a virtue when it's like humility and I'm doing this because I want to reach my potential as an athlete, or I'm doing this because I want to foster that environment and give this opportunity to this athlete. And that, like I said, health is never going to be sacrificed, right? There's a very big difference there between those two. And then number two, you know, all roads lead to money, right? A lot of times there's there's a, a common uh, denominator here of money, which is where a gym owner or a coach or someone wants to make more financial income because if they compete more, they get attention and more people go to their gym and blah, blah, blah. So there is a lot of times where money is involved here, whether it's a gym club or whether it's trying to make money off of a certain brand or an athlete or something like that. Again, it's it's a virtue if you're leading, sorry, it's a vice if you're leading it with, you just need more. It's greed, right? Greed is a vice. When you need more stuff, you need more things. You need a house, you need a car, but you need a Porsche. Now you need five cars. Now you need this, right? You need clothes, a Rolex, right? Like yeah. you need Back the to that validation, right? The exactly. External. It's the exact same thing. So again, when I was younger, I had some of this, that I needed the stuff to think that I was cool, right? I don't wear a watch. I don't, I haven't bought clothes in like five years because I've changed. I've realized how, how painful that was to live that lifestyle financially and mentally that now it's more about like, you know, having gratitude for the things you have and being content with what you have is enough, but also making sure it's this like me versus me mentality, right? Like I'm doing this, like, so say I want to do this or buy this or whatever. It's because it brings me joy and I enjoy it as a hobby, not because I need it to flex on people and show off how awesome I am. So that's the second one that I see quite a bit. And the third one, again, I'm the most guilty of this is when you use coaching or your workplace to over overwork so, that, so much that you numb yourself from thinking about things that are uncomfortable or painful in your personal life. So I did this with shift early on, which is because I wasn't dealing with my own personal life issues. I would just overwork. I would read, I would make courses, I would teach so that I was so busy and so consumed with that and with coaching that I never I didn't have to deal with the the inner, the inner demons, right? I didn't have to deal with them because I could just block them out. So I would jump from reading a lot to working in the clinic to going to coach. Then I would come home and I would watch TV and I would do that Monday through Friday. Then on, on Friday, I would go out with friends. I would do this. I would find ways to constantly distract myself from some of the deeper discomforts. And again, if you use anything, insert anything here, uh, TV, social media, alcohol, overworking, overexercising, if you're using anything to a point where you're trying to escape your own pain, it's a vice, right? But if you have the opposite side of that, the virtue led is, is facing the chaos and facing the discomfort and building emotional discomfort tolerance and finding healthy coping mechanisms to deal with that. 
that's what I went through, like I said, with therapy and with also social support to deal with my own things. And that allowed me to then be a better, you know, more emotionally stable coach, but also someone who wasn't riding the roller coaster of doing well or not doing well at meets or, you know, more people at level nine, 10 and not people level at nine, 10 and all that kind of stuff. So when I was able to do that and detach myself from the need for other people performances to indicate whether I felt like I had self-esteem as a coach, everything in my life got better. So I personally feel that's where a lot of these malicious coaching, you know, intents come from. I don't think people are evil. I don't believe that these coaches are born evil. I think they get uh, into a situation where they, they maybe haven't done the harder work every day and it boils over into these really, really terrible things. Personally, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. That's a lot. I know I intentionally made that one a lot because if I hadn't gone through it all, I probably would have never come out and I wanted to make sure I got it out on an episode. <laughs> Good for you. That takes a lot of courage right there. Um, just to add to that, I'm also not uh, perfect. I'm absolutely flawed. I make mistakes all the time. And, you know, I guess the only thing I would add to that is how do we handle the mistakes that we've made, especially as adults towards children, because we're constantly in that position, whether you want it or not, that we're role models, that we are helping to shape what children believe to be true about themselves and what they believe to be true about the world that they live in. Um, you know, I continue to make mistakes with every new stage of life and every new stage of life presents an opportunity to make more new mistakes. Mm -hmm. And we're constantly evolving. And I would say that with all of the influences that come our way via social media, via training and education, day-to-day um, -day interactions, that maybe more than ever in history, we are inundated with opportunities to make mistakes, but also opportunities to learn. And I think there's a difference between making a mistake that shows up as a struggle to learn the lessons of life and a pattern of behavior um, that we want, ha want to have a look at to make sure that we don't continue in that direction. There's a difference between those struggles and then the, the intentional or unintentional um, suppressing of all that awareness that can lead to exploiting an athlete, exploiting a child for the benefit of the adult and the benefit might not be money and it might not even be power but it might be um the benefit is that the adult doesn't have to face their shit mm. and so we need to be really really clear about the line that distinguishes between poor conduct from an emotional psychological physical abuse perspective and mistakes mm. True. Yeah, I'm very happy you said that. And first of all, it, I mean, people praise maybe my decision to do this for myself, but obviously it's a huge kudos to you too, because just the ability to view, to one, fate, admit that you've made a mistake and, or, or have made a, you know, a, a, a failure, some people call it, stuff like that. The self-reflection and the self-awareness to even admit you did something wrong instead of blame, like, you know, skirt your way around taking responsibility or accountability. That is enormously important. And it's something that very, very few people do is to even recognize I made a mistake and I'm sorry versus as soon as you blame somebody else. Right. So that's a kudos to you. But two is the the mind frame changing of this is something I can learn from and this is something that I can in investigate to figure out what I did wrong and how to make amends and how to get better versus oops, I screwed up and you just skate along with your life. And then you make the same mistake down the road and the same mistake down the road again, right? Like there's a really good uh, expression my boss uses is that you're, it's okay to make the mis make a mistake, but you should never make the same mistake twice. Right. He, tells, he tells that to people in the clinic, like ask all the questions, completely screw up, right? It's okay. But then your job is to go home and unpack that and be like, why? Why did it go wrong? Was it a technical thing that I lacked? Was it a an applicational problem that I lacked? Was it a, just a a, a pure mental uh, you know blip in the radar that I just spaced out? Why and how do I prevent that in the future? And if you can do that, if you can look at the things that are painful and use them as, like I said, emotional catalysts, as I don't want to feel this way again or I don't want to see this happen again, what can I do to change my lifestyle habits or what can I do to change my thinking around this? That's very hard to do. And I think very, very few people do that like maybe you do or other people do. Yeah. And I feel like coaches in particular, oh, society has done them a disservice as well because and and they've contributed. I've seen coaches contribute to this 
themselves also, they've painted themselves into a corner. Mm. They have, and I have emails from coaches saying, uh, don't bring your athletes in taped because we have physios that we want to do that. Okay, well, we were just at the physio appointment and you're telling me this qualified individual can't tape my kid before practice. Mm -hmm. um, also bring your kids in sick and we will decide as the coaches what they can handle from a training perspective. So mm -hmm. taking the power and responsibility out of the hands of the parents to say, actually, the child is too sick to come in or worse yet, not even asking the child and saying you're going to practice and your coaches will decide what you can do and what you can't do. How about the child has some agency to say, look, I feel like crap. I want to just lay in my bed mm. or, uh, you know, I just am not up for it. And, and kids know, right. They know their bodies. They know what they're capable of. Mm. Um, and, and who are we to say otherwise? I certainly wouldn't want someone telling me go to work. Um, I don't care that you feel awful you're going to go and you're going to perform. Yeah. So, and it, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I feel like, um, and I've known this is reflective of the last, you know, when I was in a gymnast ver and today that coaches literally want to be coaches who aren't getting it quite right. I'll say that mm. coaches that are, are running a control dominance paradigm in their coaching practice. I have experienced they want to be the physio they want to be the diagnostician on injuries they want to be the nutritionist they want to have some of the parental controls they they are putting themselves in a position where they just want the control because they think that will help them produce which i also hate that word when you're talking about a child but mm. they help them produce a better gymnast and they frankly don't have the education or the skill to take on all those roles and it's not necessary. So take the pressure off yourselves, coaches, and focus on being the technical expert that you are on the sport of gymnastics and hopefully, you know, put some effort into learning what it means to offer a child developmentally appropriate opportunities in the gym and leave the rest to the other experts. Hmm. Yeah, it comes to mind that it's very dangerous building a house of cards out of your ego. Yeah. You know, like what happens when you can't put yourself out of the equation and you say you're the physio, you say you're the sports nutritionist, you say you're the mental health provider, and that nobody else knows better than you, it all comes crumbling down on you when when you don't have a real expert in the room who actually knows what they're talking about. And so I think that's a, that's a large danger. And this, you sparked a, um, a story that I've shared in the podcast before related to athletes being able to not only speak up for themselves, but also have licensed experts is I'm not going to say when, where, how, but I was at a meet, a very high level meet and an athlete did something on some event and hit their head very, very hard. And I immediately as a medical provider in my training as a sports, uh, as in our board certifications for sports, you immediately go through and you do a concussion screen. Like that's, in, that's just like a no brainer. Football does it. Basketball does it. Everybody. So I rushed onto the floor in the event in front of the coach during the 30 seconds. And I screened her for a concussion and the world imploded. They thought they're like, what are you doing? You can't go on the floor. It's the coach who has to decide whether the athletes fit to continue. And I was like, excuse me, the, the, the coach who has skin in the game, who is not medically trained is going to determine whether the 10 year old has a concussion who is scared shitless right now and wants to just keep going because they're terrified of the moment and they're embarrassed. How is that a good idea? And then, you know, I went through it and the whole situation, the, the person at that place doing the, the meet was like, you can't do that. You can't run. Out. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm going on the floor. You can fire me now if you want, because I'm not going to I'm not going to change what I'm doing. If someone has a concussion, I'm going to pull them out. If somebody breaks their nose, I'm going to pull them out. So fire me or we can handle this after. And, you know, thankfully, I had some support systems from other people there who were like, you know what? You know, this is this is the right call. But it just it just it spoke to an overlying problem in gymnastics, which is the lack of interdisciplinary experts making the decisions, right? And think about football and in, in American football, they have neurologists on the side of the, the game who have to clear that person before they're allowed to return to the game, right? And there's many other evolutions of that. But in that moment, I was so angry and I was so like frustrated with 
the situation of the culture that allowed that that to brew up. And then very visibly a couple of years ago, this happened again. And this is different because this athlete's like a very mature 18 plus year old. But Shane Wiskus just like clearly hit his head very, very hard. And he only had 30 seconds to decide whether he could keep going or not. So he went again and he hit his head again. And then he went again and he hit his head again. Right. And he was like, we're watching this unfold on national television. I'm like, somebody stop this kid. Right. Please. Like, thankfully, he was OK. But in that situation, we should have rules and things in place. Like, no, you can stop. A medical provider comes up. There's phenomenal medical providers that meet. I know them. They give him a concussion screen and they do whatever. Yes. What it may have maybe affected his spot to Olympic trials, maybe, possibly. But he also could have broken his neck. Yeah. And I think that's a situation where we need to open these conversations of that. That's probably a really uncomfortable conversation to have in our sport about what we're going to do and how we let this happen. But if we don't do anything to change that, there's going to be another Shane Wiskus who comes everywhere across the world right now. There's little kids hitting their heads in during the meets and there's no medical providers allowed to go screen them before they get back up. And like, yeah, that's, that's the painful conversation of what we're happening for. But if we never investigate it, how are we going to make something better? How are we going to make something better? Absolutely. Wonderful point. And it's not just happening on the international stage at these top meets where there's that a lot at stake, like an Olympic spot. It's happening in the gyms every day. Right. And right. kids are hurting themselves and being told, you know, suck it up and keep going, go get a drink of water, come back and keep tumbling. Um, or worse, stop faking. You're lazy. You're just trying to get out of conditioning, all that stuff. So there's, there's so many iterations of how that can play out and none of them are good. Mm. And it kind of brings to mind this concept um, that we've talked about a little bit. And that is the difference between an, a bystander and an upstander. Mm. And at that competition where you watch the young person injure themselves and you wanted to rush out for the, to do a concussion protocol, there was let what a hundred bystanders who were standing around going, Ooh, I don't know if I should intervene. That didn't look good, but it wouldn't be right for me to jump in. So I'm just not going to jump in. And you chose to be an upstander in that position, which was you actually took action. You saw, you answered a call to action in support of an individual who was in a, a, an unsafe position. And that took a lot of moral courage. And you obviously took flack for that choice to act. Um, but that's what we're up against almost every day in sport. And it's that choice, even as a parent, if you're watching in the stands, um, if you're, you know, a, a student athletic trainer, and you're helping out on an athletic team, those are really tough decisions, because those people don't feel empowered to to stand up against the more powerful coach or the more powerful sport administrator. Right. But if we don't do that, if we don't choose to answer that call to action and be an upstander, then you know what we are? We're complicit. We're complicit in child abuse. We're complicit in athlete maltreatment. Um, and we're complicit in allowing a system to perpetuate really bad behavior. Mm. Yeah. And this is a thing I think you're speaking to a really important concept of bystander, upstander, and also what the culture has, has uh, unfortunately allowed to become the, the standard of tolerance. Like what we tolerate is what we continue to have, right? So we have situations, I think, I think the most obvious one I can think of is medical providers to coaches where the high level coaching world in some areas of the sport, because I know some really high level medical providers, I mean, some really high level coaches who are eye to eye work directly with their medical provider team all the time. So I'm not saying it's everybody, yep. but in many areas of the sport, the coach is the gatekeeper to when that person goes see a medical provider and the medical provider sits in the corner of a meet or sits in the corner of this and that at the, at the camp or whatever. And, you know, only until the, the, the high level coach says you should go see someone or something catastrophic happens or something really bad happens is the medical provider involved. It's like, Oh, sit over there and just, just don't talk and just be here as a, as a checkbox. But like, we don't want you involved actually talking about maybe we should change the way people land, or maybe we should have gymnast lift weights, or maybe this person should stop. Right. So that one I see a lot, but I also get a lot of messages from coaches and DMS about like, how that happens from coach to coach in an authoritarian kind of dictatorship or a kind of like a top down model, whereas the head coach is the legend, quote unquote, and whatever they say goes, 
And how I, I could never speak up and say, <laughs> I want to do a different drill. I could never speak up and say that because I would get ostracized and made fun of and completely mocked for that. So it happens in all areas of our sport where the person who is considered the legend, quote, quote unquote, becomes like the gold standard. And they start saying, don't talk to the medical provider or, you know, don't do those drills, only do my drills instead of a real leader, which is someone who's empathetic and someone who wants to understand and listen to everybody. Right. So I, I see this this concept of, you know, uh, a coach tries to speak up at a gym and gets chewed out by the head coach and everybody else stands there and goes, oh, this is awkward. I don't want to I don't want to say anything. Bystander. Right. Versus being like, hey, eh, eh, not OK. Doesn't matter if you've made an Olympian. That's bullshit. You don't treat people like that. Right. That is the difference of what you're talking about. And it's not only about, you know, these horrible cases of abuse, which is clearly when it's the most important. It's about micro events. It's about these small yes. daily interactions of what you tolerate. If you let a junior coach get chewed out by another coach and you sit there and watch and go, thank God it's not me. You're you're complicit. You, you allowed your cultural standard to erode and you, you might be on a chopping block when someone has a bad day. Absolutely. And so not only is it death by a thousand cuts, but we can say the opposite is true. If we yeah. step in on those micro examples, mm -hmm. that's how you build a culture towards a healthier yep. space. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you stop a bully, right? It's the same way. So if, if 400 people all said what the bully was doing and was wrong instead of watching and taking videos on their cell phone, it would change. It would change. Yes. You know, and it's no different. We have this commonality of threat of seventh grade lunch table showing up in our adult lives, all this podcast. Oh, all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I do want to kind of pull our conversation back out of the well of maybe some harsh, tough love into what do we do, right? Like we, uh, we have a lot of experience in different levels of the sport and different experiences, but how do we move from the archaic dictatorship type thing to more of a much more transformative type model. And one thing I'll say from the beginning is what I already talked about, which is again, having a spine calling out these things and highlighting positive coaches instead of only dwelling on negative coaches, right? People need a community and a positive, uh, you know, person to rally behind to say, show me a different way and help me learn a different way. Right? So what are your thoughts? What do you think from your point of view is how we start to push the boulder the other way? Well, I'm going to share some some thoughts that I've learned through a woman named uh, Dr. Jennifer Walinga out of Royal Roads University. And I really like what she had to say about the healthy coach athlete paradigm. And so the best scenario, how do you create that really healthy place for for those interactions? Well, it starts probably with leadership, but any coach could bring this to their gym um, and that's committing to core principles that really level out that hierarchical structure. So balancing the power. So it's power with, not power over your athletes. Mm, right. Um, or power with your fellow coaches, not over your coaches if you're the club director. Um, enable values to take precedence over that need to control or, do or dominate. Um, so getting clear, first of all, on what your personal values are when it comes to coaching, what are you trying to achieve? And if you're finding yourself writing down things on that piece of paper that are really aspiring to control and produce and generate, well, and, and you're talking about a child, well, those probably need some reflection. Those probably need you to go out and find yourself, um, you know, a competent professional that can help redirect those efforts. But if you find that you're putting things on that paper that says, you know, I want to bring out the best in these kids. I want to ensure that they're happy, healthy um, young adults who go out into the world and add value to it. You're on the right track. Um, so what does this mean? What does it look like? It means a shared focus between the coach and the athlete. So becoming mm -hmm. partners in achieving the athlete's goals. So unfortunately, as a coach, you're there, your job really is in service of developing athletes. You're not there in service of just developing your own professional aspirations. If you are that person, that's okay. But but coaching young people is probably not the right calling for you. Take your aspirations to a leadership role in the club where you are developing the, the, 
the coaches in your space or take it to a sports administrator role in, in, in your, uh, you know, associations or federations like USAG or Jim mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. try to run for a board. Like there's other places that you can take your, your gymnastic skill. Um, that's more appropriate for your aspirations. It's a better fit. But if you're there because you love kids and you want to develop kids to be better adults, this is where you belong. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so I love driving for a, a gold medal standard. That's not based on winning. It might partially have some winning or as an unintended outcome, there'll be some success in winning, but it's not based on uh, winning. It's based on partners achieving a similar goal and, and, and really has so much more to it than the podium outcome. Hmm. Yeah. I love what you said about making sure that you are aligned with what you're talents, your aspirations, your, your, what drives you in the sport that you're finding the right fit for your, your personality, for whatever else it is. And, um, I think this is really important to realize because sometimes I think everyone is trying to cram themselves in the coaching box. They think that they can only be a coach. And I think, you know, there's a lot of other ways, like you say, to be involved and in, in maybe serve not only what makes you excited and happy, but also what is maybe your best skill set talents. And I'll be very honest with people, which I haven't talked about in the podcast with my change in coaching is, yes, I stopped coaching because um, the the gym situation was just too much for me, giving with shift, and I probably will go back soon. But in the moment, it was too much work. But also, I don't like coaching meets. It's, it's the least part, least fun part of, of coaching for me is going to meets and the pressure and the competition and the lineup. Mm-hmm thing. It's just not for me. I wasn't a competitive athlete. I didn't love that part of competing. So me, I just don't love that part of coaching. And so if I do get back into coaching, I'm probably not going to be a full time always there. I'll, I'll work on staff and I'll be involved and I'll help develop skills and spot and take a back seat. But I have zero interest in going to meets and being there with the athletes under all the pressure. It's just not for me. Mm-hmm. I think what I've found out through a lot of work and through a lot of discovery is I'm, I'm really good at this. I'm good at this kind of stuff. I'm good at talking with people and thinking and hiding for 18 hours and, and brewing and coming out and trying to and, and break things down and then offering things that I can do. I'm really good with medical care and gymnastics. I got that down, right? I'm really good with strength and conditioning. I'm really good with education and research and I'm really good with coaching and being there, but the competition aspect is not for me. It's just not for me. And I forced that for a long time. And I actually told Eva, a couple of years ago, I was like, I hate it. I hate every time we go to a meet. I really, even when the kids do well, they do amazing. I'm just like, I just don't, I don't like it. It's not for me. So that, that self-awareness came through trying to realize that. And again, not cramming myself into the box anymore. I told her, I'm like, if I come back, I'm not coaching a single meet. I'll be there. I'll set up tables for the meet, but I'm not, I'm not going to actually coach the meet. So that's kind of an aside. I think for me, my only real way to go about this for is two things. I, I want to do a global one and a specific one. Cause I don't want anyone to, to blame the other person. The, the individuals say, the NGBs have to do it. And the NGBs say, well, it's the, it's the individual coach's responsibility. So there's, there's, there's pieces here for both educational model. And I talked about this before we need to overhaul the educational system in gymnastics to mirror the medical model, which mm-hmm. is half academic and half mentorship. Okay. So we need to create uh, a gold standard. And a lot of places, countries do this with like fig has their levels and stuff, but it still needs work to do. If you want to, if you say, I want to coach, the first thing that happens is background checks, all that kind of stuff, the legal aspects, the red flags. But when that person is deemed to be ready to rumble, it should be a six to 12 month. I don't really know the best way to do it. Mandatory coursework academically and clinical mentorship at your gym. So you need to learn child development, child psychology, basics of human development, basics of how you have social skills and talk to young kids that are, you know, age, whatever. And you also then need to have, where do you put your hands in a cartwheel? Why is it not safe for a two-year-old to do a bridge by themselves? All that kind of stuff. You need to be tested and academically understand that information. That is the responsibility of the individual to invest in it. It's the responsibility of the NGB to create it, right? To create it by experts who are the best gymnastics coaches, the best medical providers, the best strength conditioning coaches, the best nutritionists, the best sports psychologists, the best parent groups, right? That has to be academically the standard. And then on the other side, as you study your academic work, just like the medical model in school is you have to be in the clinic experiencing things virtually or right in, right in front of you. So shadow and watch where the, the, how the group is conducted and watch one of these expert coaches put together a preschool class and watch how they make back hip circle drills and learn all the things after six months, you take an academic test and then we have a mock 
run a class for 45 minutes or show us what you would do on these stations. And we have to make sure that you're, you're good to go. And then that's the first one. The second layer past that is, okay, if you want to work in optionals or you want to work in elite, or you want to work in the NCAA, or you want to work on higher level, there's another six to 12 months of advanced workshop type stuff like that, where advanced, you know, academics and advanced mentorship, where, you know, the Amy Bormans of the world and the Tom Meadows of the world are facilities where you can go to and do a residency or do an internship for six months and learn that. I don't see any other way out of it besides that. I really don't. I don't see any other single way to get really excited coaches who want to do the right thing to feel confident to do the right thing and be there. And where does that financially get paid for? Right. That's the next question as well. Just like school, it's a, it's an investment that you make as a person, right? I paid a lot of money because I believed in my education. So maybe half of it is paid for by the individual. And then half of it is covered either through the gym that is hiring them or the NGB can contribute. And that is a commitment that, okay, we'll pay for your schooling if you work here for a year or if you work here for two years and you're part of our community. And then after that, go do your favorite thing. So I think, I think for me, that is really the only way out of here. And I'm not sure if, if, if you have thoughts on that before I share the more individual one, but um, I think I love the sound of that model. Yeah. You know, and, and the medical, the medical world is one of our more successful, uh, hybrid efforts to have really, really smart academic individuals, um, put that to use in the real world to actually mm -hmm. heal people mm. physically and emotionally. So I think that's a, a fantastic um, parallel to gymnastics and where we'd like to see ourselves go. Mm. You know, the one piece that I would add to that, that I think could be really effective is the, uh, leadership coaching model. And so, you know, everyone talks about having a personal coach or a business coach, that sort of thing. Well, how about a coach's coach on the floor? Mm. So yes. when, you know, when a coach gives feedback or instruction correction to a gymnast, the coach, the coach's coach is is standing um, at their shoulder saying, OK, now get down on your knee because this child is only seven. Look them in the eye. Change your tone. Take a breath before you say it because I hear mm. you're getting frustrated. Mm. Yes. OK, say the thing. And then the child walks away and then you debrief in three seconds with your coach and say, how did it how was that? OK, what my suggestion would be, you know, um, change your language a little bit so that it comes off more positively. Uh, there was a small element of shame in there. So let's clear that out. You know, like all kinds of things could come yeah. out of that, but it's yeah. a shadowing it's, it's mentorship, but it's a, sh a shadow and it's not a coach. It's uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting really <laughs> confusing with my language. Okay. It's not a gymnastics expert who functions as the coach's coach. It's a child development specialist. It's a change uh, consultant. It's, there's so many uh, people that are really well skilled, even a, like a social worker could do a very good job in in this yes. situation. Yes, absolutely. Very well said. And then I guess my other side of this coin that I don't want to let people kind of wriggle away from this because it's probably the most important for me is on an individual level. If you truly want to change your situation and you're listening to this, you're on a run or you're sitting in your car and you're driving to the gym or you're driving where there is no way out of this that doesn't involve you facing your own personal demons. And right. this is, I have done a lot of really, really hard things in my life. And I've done some really, really challenging things. There is nothing that has been more challenging or more time consuming or more work and more uncomfortable than truly digging into my own levels of fears and insecurity. And I'll share some things that I haven't shared in the podcast because I really want people to, to resonate with this, even if it's a little bit of vulnerability. But when I went through therapy and the things that I learned is that there's conceptually for me, there's this ladder that happens in everybody. There's like some topics that if they, they're talked about or dealt with, it, it, it like it bugs you a little bit and like hits a nerve, but it doesn't like, you know, implode you, right? As you get deeper down these levels and it has to deal with the, the more fear and the more insecurity hits home, maybe from stuff in your past or things that you've gone through and everybody has their own, you know, war to face, the deeper you crawl down that ladder into the most really darkest and terrifying things that you're scared of in your life, you start to then really get triggered by, when someone says something about you or when something happens, right? So Eva and I have talked about this in the podcast, so both of us can firmly share. For Eva, financial things with money is a really deep ladder rung. Like for some reason, her past, her experience, that makes her really anxious. She really struggles with money in terms of managing it. They're not problems, but just it, give, it gives her a lot of anxiety and it makes it really, really hard for her to deal it. 
I don't give a shit about money. Mm -hmm. Like money is very much a thing that I do to do other things that I like, right? Like it's important to have money. I don't want to be broke and I want to like take care of myself. I have fun hobbies. But if, if I, you know, all of a sudden, and this happened twice with Shift, I'm like, if Shift went to zero and, and completely bankrupted it, I'd be like, oh, we had a good run. You know, like I'll, I'll start over. Like it's not a big deal for me. But for me personally, it always came down to personal relationships in my outside life with like dating relationships, all that kind of stuff. For some reason, I don't know why, but my own turmoil with my family life and my personal relationships created enormous anxiety for me. So if I was going through a bad breakup or if I got like rejected really hard, it would it explode me for some reason. And I would be very, very angry and very, very upset. And so for me, even though that part of my life had nothing to do with coaching, it clearly impacted my manners and rhythms in the gym. And like I said, a combination of this fear of rejection and having really hard situations dating people that combined with not sleeping enough, overworking to numb myself with pain and trying to make find a different way to get around not dealing with that made me angry in the gym and made me snippy and have a short fuse. And although it was never the, something the girls did wrong, sometimes it came out as something that I snapped on them for because I wasn't dealing with the real thing behind me. So I challenge people, if you really want to make a difference, is you have to be willing to do whatever you need to journal, to therapy, to you know, social friends, whatever, to crawl down that ladder. And it took me five years. It took me five years from the start of when I was 26 to probably a year and a half ago is when I really felt that I was settled into this. But it takes you working on that because if you can deal with that and you can build a source of internal self-esteem where you don't need anybody else and you don't need anybody else's praise, you can walk into your job as a coach, as a medical provider, as anything else, and you're you're not pinballed by good or bad things. You can neutrally see events and deal with them head on. And I think it's a really important thing to, to realize is that because I had the self-esteem and I built my own discomfort tolerance, I actually don't hear a lot from the general audience, positive or negative. My shift community, the people who really care about me, I always listen to their feedback. But if random people that I don't know on Facebook, like this happened really early on when I was starting to maybe rock the boat a little bit, people were like, you're full of shit. You're ruining gymnastics. What do you know? You're not, you don't have, you have a coach in elite. You know, you have no idea what you're talking about. I was crushed by that when I was pre dealing with my own demons. But now I'm like, I have empathy. I'm like, you don't understand me, man. You've never seen a day in my life. You don't know what's really going on. So I don't hear that negativity as much. But on the same side, I don't hear the positivity really as well, because it, not that it's not it doesn't feel good, it's cool, but I don't need people's positive affirmations to keep waking up early and working or to make sure that I'm working on this research project because it's what I believe in is the best version of myself. So I'm not pinballed back and forth by you're a piece of shit, you have no idea what you're talking about, or oh my God, you're amazing, we love you so much, thank you for doing the podcast. It, both of those are like, okay, all right, cool. Am I doing what I think is the best version for me? And am I meeting my own expectations? If somebody close to me, if Eva comes up to me and says, Hey, listen, you're kind of being, you're kind of being a jerk right now. That, like, oh, wait a minute. She knows me really well. And she's seen me through the last 10 years. So that I take to heart, but everything else, not really. And it's only possible because of five years of crawling uphill in the mud with what my biggest fears are and my biggest insecurities are. And I deal with it every day. I'm like everybody else. I have the same worries and the same fears about everything else that we deal with, but I have developed coping strategies. And I think that's what I looked up to for people who were my role models. I saw their ability to do that. And I was inspired by that. And I think now maybe people who listen to the podcast are maybe having a similar effect where, you know, I'd like to not feel like crap when I go to work, or I'd like to not, you know, feel so miserable all the time when I'm, I'm tired and overworked and I'm stressed out with the girls at the meet. So that's my advice to people. And I don't know if we want to go more or leave it there, but I, I think that the only way out of this is the backbone of holding people accountable, positive role models to follow the educational system, and then people putting, putting a very serious hat on to deal with their own, their own personal life. Well, I do not want to move on without at least acknowledging the work that you've done, because even what you're saying is your journey is so important. It's important for yourself, but it's important for a lot of people to hear. And wow, you know, for a 26 year old to come to that place where they're prepared to face the demons and move forward, man, you just saved yourself 30 years of torture yeah. because you could have waited till you were 55. And with a couple of marriages in the gutter and maybe some kids that don't want to talk to you and decide, OK, fine, it's time to face the demons. So, you know, I hope that anyone listening is is even 
inspired a little bit to take a closer look at what's driving them. And, you know, your analogy about the hurt you were feeling from, from your past, from your upbringing, and then the anger and rage you were feeling by the slightest triggers in the gym, that's a sign. And if anyone else is going through that, you know, it's okay. And what that is telling you is that you are walking around feeling hurt all mm. the time. Rage and anger are a manifestation of pain. And so if you find yourself raging all the time, chances are you're actually in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And if your ankle is hurting and you can't run, what do you do? You go to the physio. If your uh, heart is hurting or you're demonstrating rage and anger all the time, what do you need to do? Probably need to call up that psychologist or do some good reading uh, of some books or podcasts or whatever it is, whatever resources you can put your hands on to, to get some help. And people are so willing to help. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guarantee you someone called, would, if they called me up or called you up or called, um, you know, other, other inspiring individuals that they know in their lives and asked for a hand, people are willing to offer it. Yeah. And, and and I think it's important because our rage can do us in. And, you know, I could be really angry about my daughter's um, experience in gymnastics or my own experience in gymnastics or or your experience could could make me rage up because it's really sad and it's really hard. And it's really unfortunate that we had these situations. But what I find um now, because I'm 50, I'm able to to not go to rage and not go to anger, but I go to advocacy. You know, I've basically spent the last six years working for free to try to transform gymnastics culture. Mm -hmm. And I know, Dave, you've you've done a tremendous amount of work and you're not compensated monetarily for it. Neither am I. And yet we just keep going because it's driven not by anger, which burns out and makes you and leaves you feeling burnt out. It's driven by this passion to to allow gymnastics or sport in general to live up to the promise it makes to us. You know, mm -hmm. sport is supposed to be fun and it's exciting and it's challenging and and it teaches us about things. And when you bring toxicity into that, it's devastating and you don't learn any of those really good life lessons. Mm. And I just, I, I mean, I've never felt more inspired to continue to bring positive change for the benefit of the athletes. Yes, of course, I want to protect children from having, um, you know, terribly self-destructive uh, mental health when they're older, because I see it as complete carnage uh, in the gymnastics community. But, but I, it's not just that. Like it's, it's the fact that we can just do this sport better so it adds to, um, to people becoming really uh, productive citizens who are bringing joy and love and um, really positive attributes to, to everything that they do going forward. And if we continue in this direction, we're going to just become a more divisive, polarized, toxic continent, because I think what happens in Canada is reflective of what happens in the U.S. and vice versa. I mean, we're very well connected as people. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much there's so much room for this to get better. And we need to stop limping along the way we've been limping for 50 years mm -hmm. Yeah, step up, people. Everybody, just step up. Let's work together. Let's rely on each other. Let's call each other for support. Um, yeah, and back to that task force I mentioned that I'm a part of. Those people keep me alive and inspired. I mean, most of them aren't even gymnasts in mm. past, and yet they are fully dedicated to this cause because they also see that if we can improve things in gymnastics where it's been amplified in the media. And frankly, I think it is uh, a sport with some of the deepest rooted issues. Mm -hmm. If we can fix gym, we can fix any sport. I agree. I agree. And it's so important what you said about that concept of, of, of not bringing anger and rage to a situation or not 
you know, allowing yourself to be that because something that I always think about in the back of my mind of as I approach those situations and I try to be empathetic is that hurt people hurt people, yeah. right? So if somebody is deeply going through something challenging and they're very, very in a hard spot, those are typically the people who are like back to the Instagram comments thing of someone in the comment section, you know, spewing hate that those are people who are really deeply hurting. And I think we need to take a better empathetic approach to, you know, that gym coach who you see, you know, really, really angry, flipping out and stuff like that. You know, there's those people are no different than you and I, and they have their own situations to deal with. And, you know, while we're in here talking about it, I think for, I want to leave it on the note that for, for everybody listening, and this is how I was when I listened to these podcasts of people that I follow up to, you say like in your mind, like, right, but my situation's worse. Mm -hmm. Yes. But my, my problem, it's not the same, right? Like you don't understand the vices that I have or the problems that I have. I probably don't, to be honest. I probably don't understand something as devastating as a medical illness or losing someone you really, really care about. But I can I can share with you, and I've never said this in a podcast, but there's probably not a vice out there that I didn't use at one point to try and deal with my own personal issues, right? As outside of illicit drugs, my brother was a heroin addict and it kind of destroyed our family. And so I watched that carnage, like you say, fall apart. But it's outside of that, money, social media, buying stuff, drinking too much, materialistic stuff, everything else you can think of greed, all that stuff. I can tell you that I've been there and it didn't, it didn't help. It didn't help. It made things much, much worse. So like I said, if you're in your car and you're running or something in this podcast is hitting home because you're like, Oh, that sounds like something that might be triggering for me. I promise you there's somebody in your situation, whether it's me or someone else who has clawed their way out uphill to a better lifestyle and to a better mm -hmm. level of happiness, because I was cripplingly depressed when I was at my worst, very, very bad, like would leave my house for three or four days in a row. So if I can crawl out of those things, I have people in my life who are positive examples that I followed. And I think everybody else has a few examples of people in their life who they can follow. But I hope they serve as an example of what can happen when you truly do the harder work and you're willing to for some people, it's not spend money on stuff. For some people, it's wake up earlier and, and work out. For some people, it's have a moment of pause before they yell at their athletes because they're a little snippy that day, right? There's there's a huge benefit cumulatively compounding interest-wise to those small choices you make every day to, 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 to really build a better environment you're proud of. And I think that's a reason why I see a lot of people eventually become really happy is because of those thousands of choices they make every day when no one's watching by themselves without any praise, no one's clapping for you, but they do it for themselves and they truly come out better side. And those are the coaches that I look at. And I'm like, yeah, you're a good human. Like I can tell why you're, you're such a positive uplifting person because you've figured out your own bullshit and you've dealt with your own demons and vice versa. I am not going to go anywhere near this and talk about specifics, but I have seen some experiences where really, really notable coaches around the world, when I get behind closed doors and I talk with them or other people, and you you take an inside peek into what happens outside of their gymnastics life, and it's really sad sometimes. I'm like, oh, I got it. Yeah, this is this is all you got. This is this is your life. Gymnastics coaching and you is everything you have. And because maybe you're not proud of some of the choices in your personal life, it is bleeding over where you need this to be happy. And this distracts you from the discomfort of what's going on. And so I understand it, man. I understand at every corner and facet of it, but I promise you it is worth the work. It is. And just because it's hard work, I mean, isn't that what gymnastics has said <laughs> all of this up for? Right out of my head. I was going to say that exact same thing. <laughs> gymnastics has set us up for this. Like it's, it's taught us how to work hard. That's the essence. If any sport has taught that lesson to its athletes, it's gymnastics teaching resilience, perseverance, and the ability to work hard and see the result. And, you know, let's, let's also take that back a step and say, you know, if the, the words hard work are evoking terror in somebody's body right now, as they listen, hard work could also mean look at one thing in your life, you know, Maybe your father left you when you were nine and you've been longing for love from a father figure for decades. Okay, so look at that one thing. Don't look mm. at the 50 other things that are probably there too, because we all have, let's say, a minimum of like 75 things that <laughs> in our lives that, you know, cause us pain and, and challenge. But pick one thing and, and tackle that one thing just even a little bit because, mm. you know, it it doesn't have to be 
all of it and all of it at once. Not everybody will follow, you know, the Dave Tilly model of let's, let's like dive head first, full body into the swimming tank and do it all in five years, right? Mm -hmm. There's no shame in taking 10 years to unpack things slowly, 15 years, whatever the number is, it's not important. Yep. Um, but a lot of us are goal oriented. You know, I, when I was in my twenties, I had a really significant, um, mental health challenge I needed to overcome. And I said to the psychologist, tell me, tell me how long this is going to take. Give me a number. And he said three months. And I was like, yes, I can do it. I'm three months done. And I was because I a, was a gymnast who was goal oriented and, and that really helped me. Um, other things in my life, you know, I'm still working on and I'm 50. So mm -hmm. it, it, you know, but I feel better for having tackled some of those other things earlier in my life. Um, it'll certainly allowed me to be, you know, a, a better human being. And yeah, I mean, these are, these are not easy things, but we're not alone. And um, people in our sport are not alone. This is this, this travels across all boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's the beautiful thing about being a human being is that we are all suffering and all, um, uh, experiencing joy in different ways in the same way. Um, but without a doubt, I have great faith in humanity to step up, to support each other and that we just have to go outside a little bit of ourselves to ask for that help or to seek out someone who is doing the thing you want to do in the way you want to do it and mm. to seek some guidance there. Mm. It's, it's a massive kudos to you because like I said, I know how hard that work is to go through something like that, particularly, you know, 30 years ago, whatever else it should be, maybe when you had a stigma around mental health and there maybe was not as much, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm born in a time where, you know, my friends and I can talk about it comfortably and it's not so stigmatized. I think that's a really, really good benefit, but yeah. yeah, it's so funny. You mentioned that about, you know, what do we get out of gymnastics, right? This brings this conversation full circle where I talked about the beginning of, well, it's because of the fear relationship. It's because of the work, the need for patience, the learning from your mistakes. It is exactly what we're talking about here with your own personal life. And why do you think I'm still involved in coaching? Because the, the sport and the environment gave me the tools to do this, what I'm talking about. And I hope that in some small way by teaching someone gymnastics, I can instill those values in them that maybe five years, 10 years down the road, when they hit a speed bump, they too will maybe have some tools in their tool belt along with many other experts to deal with it. So that again, goes back to this is the what can happen when it's done well, what can happen when it's done well is that you can build incredible, you know, healthy people who love gymnastics. Yes, that's important. But also, you are building a foundational bedrock for someone to be able to uh, deal with hard stuff. It's terrifying. It is terrifying to deal with yeah. your own demons. There's so much fear involved, but you build up a tolerance to it. You slowly expose yourself to more, a little exposure therapy, a little bit, and it gets better and better. So that is what can happen if it's done well. Yeah. And, you know, you said earlier um, the cost, right? So, mm -hmm. what is the cost of not doing um, a little of the work now or a lot of the work now? What's the cost? Well, the cost is that if you're in a leadership position, especially as a coach, the cost of those, those children's development. And now we're setting those kids up to go through all the trauma and pain that that the coach went through. And, you know, and, and we have normalized it in sport that it's it gets us to the winning position. It gets us to the top of the podium. But I think winning without considering the cost of getting there is negligence. We, we cannot continue like that. As I said before, now we know better. And so we can't replicate that. And, you know, just to bring one more point in from that um, Dr. Walinga, she calls that winning with benefits. So it's trying for excellence in more than just the performance outcome. So mm -hmm. how to have it all without the devastating costs or the win at all cost model, because it's actually not conducive to winning when you consider winning in the spirit of winning at life. Um, that there is, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or you don't have to win or lose. It can be, uh, I think we need to start to look at winning from the perspective of what else did I win out of that effort? You know, did what else came from 
from that experience besides where I finished on the podium? You know, are we recognizing kids who are being great teammates? Are we recognizing kids who apologize for uh, hurting someone's feelings? Are we recognizing our athletes when they are super uh, good at regulating their emotions or uh, lowering their own anxiety? Or maybe they took really special care to prepare for that meet by not having the sleepover the weekend before or, you know, getting proper nutrition leading up to the meet. Like, what did that competition teach them about themselves and their capabilities beyond whether or not they got a medal? Hmm. Yeah, it's crucial. It's very, very crucial thing about all these things. And I want to I think the best place to leave it is that rough waters ahead still but totally doable it will be very hard it will take longer than you think it will be more work than you think but it will 100 percent be worth it if you choose to do it yes I absolutely think. and we are all in the gymnastics community so well positioned to mm. tackle this and to to get through it to get through those rough waters because this is what we've been trained to do our mm -hmm. whole lives we've been trained to persevere and to look at a problem and tackle it with skill and joy and and passion. Mm. Well said. Well, Kim, I could talk to you for two more hours, but I really appreciate you. I think we tackled most of the things in the outline. I kind of lost sight of it because I got so excited about talking about these random tangents we had. But um, I think I think maybe we'll call it here and let people digest, and maybe we can circle back if those in the community have questions, want clarification, or stuff like that. So, any parting words before we pass on? Just thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for the platform. I think every conversation we can have about these challenges and the road to recovery is another step towards that healing. And, and we all deserve it. Every coach deserves it. Every athlete deserves it. And it's opportunities like this that help us get to that place that we want to go. Mm, yeah. I have one more thing that I have to say. Listening to podcasts is what originally triggered me to want to start going to therapy and getting help. Mm. So I appreciate the people who listen to podcasts and want to learn. That's why I do it because it was randomly during like, I don't even remember when it was, but I was like watching a podcast and a uh, psychologist from Stanford was on and I read his book and the book got me to eventually pull the trigger. So keep learning, keep listening. You might, Amazing. there might be seven seconds in this podcast that hit home for you, or maybe it's another podcast. Maybe it's somebody else's podcast. Doesn't have to be mine, but yeah, I, uh, I, I applaud those people out there who are still trying to find ways to get better. So I applaud Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Great. All right. Take care, Thanks, Kim. Dave.